Tata Hage Ita Haloro Bokora Tata Tabahaya Ita Haloro Bokora Tata Tabahaya In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Ye kula rororobo korata haya. Bekiye kala rororobo korata tahaya. Ye kie kalororo bokura tata haye. Ma 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 ti e kalororo bokura tata bahaye. Ye kie kalororo bokura tata haye. Ye kie kalororo bokura tata haye. Alororo bokura tata bahaye. Ye ki ala barata talarata tata bahay Ye alorobo robo korata talarata tata bahay Hallelujah 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 Ye ki ala bata haya. Ye ala rata la 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 di ala roro mo korata tata haya. Ala roro roro mo korata tata bahaya. Ye ye ala mama makahaya. Ye ala roro roro mo korata haya. Alamone ye suki e kalororobo korata tabahai. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Huh? Woo! My. My, my, my. Halorobo korata tata haya. Hallelujah. 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 He kalarata haya. Ki elarata haya. Hallelujah. 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 My. Ikata bahaya la rata tolo robo korata tata babahaya. Hey, ki e kala rai. Ala roro 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 bo korata tata babahaya. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of the office placed upon me, in Jesus' name I impart to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full and complete knowledge of him that the knowledge of that revelation would shine light on the understanding of your heart, that you might know the things that are freely given to us of God, and that you might walk in them and do as God wills you to do. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I receive it. I receive it, Jesus. I receive it, Jesus. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You want to hear something supernatural? You're not praising God like people who've already been in church for 12 and a half hours and less than 42. You, you know the problem? You're kind of blowing all this idea to kingdom come that uh, we need to keep short, church short and brief because people won't take it. When are we going to stop lumping Hungry people in with the ones that aren't. When are we going to stop making our decisions and allow only allowing God to lead us in ways that fit the unhungry? I don't know if that's a word. I just made it up, I guess. When are we going to stop leading, trying to lead those that aren't hungry and start leading those that are? You want to see major revival in your church? Make up your mind you're going to love everybody, but you're only going to lead the hungry. Quit trying to lead people that aren't hungry. I said quit trying to lead people that aren't hungry. And quit making your decisions on ministry of what kind of ministry you're going to offer and on prayer meetings and all of that based on whether or not the, those that aren't hungry will show up. Don't you realize that those, it's those meetings when those that aren't hungry don't show up that God's able to do the maximum? Why would you want to eliminate those to appeal only to those that aren't hungry? Praise God. You may be seated. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. If you were God and you wanted your people to be on the lookout for you and to Observe various things as indicators that you were about to come and fulfill your promises to them. Would you use the devil as your indicator? But how many people who are studying the Bible and preaching about prophecy, focus on the Antichrist rather than Jesus Christ. (laughs) 
That, does that make sense? It's not even reasonable that God, in order to get his people to expect his coming, would use what the devil was doing as the signs to let you know he was about to come. Does that even make sense? Oh, well, there's a verse for that. Uh, that says exactly that. I mean, you know, uh, it's Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. Let's read it. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for the Antichrist shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Surely that must be what it says because most prophecy gurus, that's what they want you to focus on and that's what they preach and teach about. You know it's true. Well, excuse me for not being in that group. Because I don't believe that the Antichrist and what the world is doing is the sign that we're looking for. Let me read the truth here before we go on. I want to make sure it's read in case somebody didn't read it that's watching. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, Christ shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I made this statement and freaked a friend of mine out. Oh, don't say that. I used to carry around a bigger wallet. I got sick and tired of that, so I went to this one. The other night, all I brought was my driver's license. I... You may not have noticed, but I can't stand a minister with stuff in my pockets, especially in my front pocket. I, it's a weird thing with me. I, don't, I can't explain it. But I take it out, and oh, I pile it all over here. And I made the statement, if they ever give me a chance to take a chip so I don't have to carry a wallet, I'm first in line. <laughs> oh, that's the mark of the beast. My friend, there has to be a beast before there can be a mark of the beast. And he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And there can't be a mark of the beast till there's a beast. And there can't be an antichrist and a beast and a mark of the beast while the church is still here. Now, I say that for effect. I doubt I did do it. Okay, just, just to clarify the point. But it won't be for the reason that you think. It'll be because I don't want them to track where I am. That's why I don't carry a cell phone, an iPad. I don't have GPS in my car. None of that because I don't want them to track where I am. Sarcasm alert. <laughs> this, this is from the Iniquity Company. Everything is I. It's the promotion of the I. Everything is I. If you don't have a, a small case I in front of what you got, you don't have anything. It's all second rate and cheap. You can just take this however you want to. I'm not trying to be crude or whatever. But this is never beyond arm's reach from me 24 hours a day. Because this is a personal communication device. And this is his mini me. And when they start, somebody's going to tell me you can do it now. 
nobody told me that. Verizon didn't say I could do it. When I start being able to make phone calls on that, oh, why don't you get the, don't use that curse word galaxy with me. I don't want to hear it. You like it. That's your business. God bless you. I have got way too many hundreds. <laughs> I just put it that way. It's probably a little bit more than, it's probably a different num word to use, but apps. And that's the deal, isn't it? Because they won't let me transfer those. So I'm stuck with the bite out of the apple. Right. And I don't want any mini thing either. When they come out with one a little bit bigger, I'll probably go for that. Why? I mean, you understand, you do understand, don't you? That law enforcement and other agencies, even if it's not legal, are capable of tracking you where you are. I was told 15 years ago by an individual in our church that works for one of those agencies that back then they could pull up in the vicinity of your house and remotely turn your computer on that was completely powered off in your house and access everything on your computer from outside your house, and that was 15 years ago. And that probably so understates the capabilities, it would scare us to death. So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, when I was a kid, there was this book written, 1994, in 84, 80, 84, 84. That's where Big Brother was first coined. And I remember as a kid in high school having to read that book thinking, I don't see us how we'd ever get to that place. We have so blown past that place that that book seems like kindergarten. But, the, but where I'm headed with all this little ranting is that this isn't about the Antichrist. Since I don't really know what your doctrine of the end time is in here, I'm going to share this with you and Sister Elizabeth. This isn't in notes. But I was, uh, Cisco and I were sitting with a a good friend, and he is a good friend. I have great respect for all he's done. But I, the lead post-trib guy in the United Pentecostal Church. And we were sitting at a table in a hotel room back around 90, 91, whatever it was. And we were, I knew, I knew he knew I was pre-trib. And I knew he wanted to ask me, and I wouldn't help him out. I waited him out till he asked me. And finally, he couldn't help it anymore. And he says to me, sitting there in front of Brother Cisco, I mean, it was, I mean, it, there was no animosity or either side. It was just he asked the question. Uh, Brother Wright, uh, are you, uh, I understand you're pre-trib, yeah. He said, so you read Clarence Larkin's book. Don't even own it. Never seen it. Well, whose book did you read? The Bible. You got pre-trib out of the Bible? Oh, yeah. How? I said, well, I'll tell you what, brother. I got two questions to ask you. Just two. You answer these two questions, and I'll be post-trib this moment sitting at this table. That's all. You don't have to explain any other scriptures. Just answer these two questions. And I'm not just... Going on some tangent, there's always a reason, okay? This is setting you up. Okay, I, I wouldn't be a good comedian because I tell the punchline before the joke, right? So I'm setting you up. 
So he said, well, what are those two questions? I said, uh, if you will go for me, please, to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked and beheld a door was open in heaven. The first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So someone was invited to heaven and was told that when they responded to that invitation, they were going to be shown the things that were going to happen after they got there. And immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. A throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Logos. The only part of the, the infinite God that could sit on the throne sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And that Greek word there is throne. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders, thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like in the crystal, and in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, third beast had a face as a man, fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and the rest, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. That's not once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Ghost. It is, it is the same way as we would say, Holy est, holy, holier. Holy est. So it's holy, holy, holy. The max degree. Lord God Almighty, which, which was and is and is to come. Now can that be the God who is from everlasting to everlasting no beginning, no ending, at every place and every time simultaneously. No. Because he would say, which I am, and I am, and I am. So who is this talking? The only part of the I am God that could refer to this would be the Logos, the I am expressed, the infinite God expressed to the finite. Because the one who is talking is the one sitting on the throne. That can't be the one that fills all space. It has to be the only part of him that can and that which he expressed to the finite. Because apparently there is a throne someplace. And that's a specific spot. And the Logos, which is the I am expressed into the finite, the, the I am infinite God expressed into the finite, is sitting on that throne in that spot. How do I know that? Because there's 24 elders sitting in the throne around him. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him. The implication is there every time that praise breaks out, the four and twenty elders fall out of their seats, fall off their thrones, fall at his feet, and cast their crowns at his feet, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I said to my brother, 
Who is the 24 elders? I said he is because they're a group, a corporate group. I'm not emphasizing the number. I'm emphasizing the entity. Who is the 24 elders? They're already in heaven before the first seal is opened. Who are they? If you do a study of the specific promises made by God to the church, every single promise made by God to the church was received by the 24 elders. Now, some people get stuck on the number 24. Oh, and let me say this. The Greek word there trans translated elder is presbyterios, which is never anywhere in the Bible used to refer to angels. It's always humans. Whoever these are, they are humans already in heaven before the first seal is open, sitting on thrones, sitting in the presence, sitting in the presence of God, around his throne, robes of white, and crowns, crowns. We'll read quickly next chapter, verse 1. That was the last verse of that chapter, in case you didn't know. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, read quick here for a minute, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So the 24 elders are in heaven watching this take place. And you'll see that in a minute. It actually says that. And I saw a strong, a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the books and to loose the seven seals thereof. Logos made flesh. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Some people want to make that God on the throne, and this, this is Jesus. No, this is the process of sacrifice. Because that lamb standing there looked like he was dead because he'd been slain. Having seven heads and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth throughout the earth. So when you see Jesus, he's going to look like a lamb that's dead, and he's going to have seven Crowns and seven heads, seven eyes. Whoa, the image of God changed a lot since he got to heaven. Not so. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders who were there at that exchange fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and gold. That's not, it must be those, those four beasts because me and the harp thing, we, we just. And golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song saying, they, included in 24 elders, sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast, past tense, wast slain, and hast redeemed us, past tense, to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nations. That was the 24 elders saying that. that then that means you believe there's only, go back to the verse please. Sorry. Then that believes you that means you only believe there's only 24 kinds of kindred, only 24 languages or dialects, only 24 types of people and only 24 nations in the world. So obviously the number of 24 is figurative. 
And in my search of the scripture, I can't find any other mention of the t- word number 24 of having significance. So the only thing you conclude is two twelves. Whatever that figure is supposed to stand for, it represents something that is represented by two twelves. I think the city of New Jerusalem that was prepared for the bride coming down out of heaven, it had 12 gates, which are named after the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 foundations named after the 12 apostles. I see 12 plus 12. But now, you got to see the past tense here. Just like he was slain, past tense, they've been redeemed, past tense. In other words, an accomplished fact. Redeemed us too, God, by thy blood out of every kindred tongue and people and nation. Next verse. Thou hast, hast made us, past tense, not will make us, not you are making us. It's an accomplished fact. You And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Notice the difference in verb tenses there. You have made us kings and priests. We shall reign. Making us kings and priests is an accomplished fact. The reign and the earth part still future tense. Next verse. And I beheld and I heard a voice, the voice of many angels round about the throne of the beast, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. If that's the last verse, I think, yeah, no. I want to go on to chapter 6, verse 1, when we get to the end. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb forever and ever. Now that should be six and one. And the four beasts said, Amen. Nope. And the four, el- tw- four twenty elders fell down. Well, they, we, we, we just love to fall down at his feet, don't we? Fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Nobody else in heaven does that. No angel falls down at his feet. Now I think we're at 6 1. And I saw when the Lamb and is a conjunction connecting what is now happening with what was just happening. In sequence. And I saw when the, I mean, he didn't say I saw. He said, and I saw. That's not insignificant. When the, when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. So here's the point. The first seal of what is called by some erroneously Great tribulation. Because in the book of Revelation, the great tribulation it only ever refers to three and a half years of the seven. The biblical term for the entire seven years is either Daniel's 70th week or da- the time of Jacob's trouble. So I said to this friend of mine, if this 20, these 24 elders are not the church, who are they? You can look. I've already looked. There's no other human beings mentioned anywhere in the Bible that even received one of the promises of God for the church. But these 24 elders received every single one of them. Only to the church was it promised we would sit in his presence, around the throne with him, be made kings and priests to rule and reign with him, that we would receive crowns. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I looked at him and he didn't say anything. 
I say, you ready for the second question? Yeah. Let's go to Revelation chapter 7, please. And skip down to past the 144,000. After these things I saw four, no, that's the beginning of it. Let's go down, skip real quickly through probably, I think it's like seven or eight verses. Let's try one more. One more, nine, okay, nine. After this, after, after he had sealed these 144,000 in their foreheads, and they were all virgins. They, were, they did not, had not known a woman. They were all dedicated to God. You know what this sounds like? Exactly like John the Baptist. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne. And before... For the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Previous to this verse, when is the last time or the next time going backwards that you find anybody with palms in their hands in the New Testament? When the Jews were welcoming their Messiah King into Jerusalem in what's called the triumphal entry, they had palms. Notice the physical position of these people. What are they doing? Standing. Are they in the midst of the throne? No, they're standing before the throne. Next verse. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne under the Lamb. Next verse. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, what elders? The 24, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory. Wait a minute, let's go back. I think that almost implies the angels did that. And all the angels stood around about. No, they stood. And about the elders of four beasts. And somebody fell. But it's not the, it's not the multitude. Wow, I hadn't seen that before. Okay, let's see who's talking. And fell before the, th wait, no, no, go back a minute. Let me finish it. And fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. What were they saying? Next verse. Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. There's nothing there an angel couldn't say. So I guess the angels joined us at his feet. Wow, I hadn't seen that before. That's good. Next verse. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Now, who, who asked John that question? One of the elders. John knew who the elder was. But the elders say unto John, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Next verse. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, implying John didn't know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What do you have to do to get a white robe? You have to be baptized in Jesus' name so that his righteousness can be put upon you. Was anybody ever baptized in Jesus' name before the day of Pentecost? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. Whose name do you think the disciples of Jesus baptized in? 
John, according to Acts 19, the disciples of John of Ephesus told us what baptism the disciples of John baptized in. They baptized in the name. John, John baptized uh, saying that you should believe on him that, uh, that should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. If John baptized that way, what way would Jesus and the disciple, his disciples baptize? In the name of Jesus. You see, oh Lord, are you ready? The only part of Acts 2.38 that is fully, solely, and totally uniquely, if you can put those two together. But that's what I'm trying to say. Totally uniquely, New Testament is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because baptism and repentance preceded it during the God of the ministry of John and Jesus. That's why that is the way that ministers you into the new covenant. That's why if you get the new covenant before you've had the way ministered to you, 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 you need to hurry up and do that part. I've told this story before. Some of you have to put up with it. When my, my, my sons are almost exactly nine years apart, when David was born, I couldn't be in the, in the uh, delivery room, but with Joel, I was. Well, Joel was two weeks late by man's calculations. And uh, I was in the delivery room, and they had this little mirror down there. I thought I'd be grossed out, but I wasn't at all. I didn't pass out either, believe it or not. Wow. And I'm watching this, and this is really amazing to me. The only way I knew there was something bad going on was because she was killing my hands every time she'd have a contraction. But other than that, I was totally fascinated with this. Well, from the time his, his, the crown of his head crested in her uh, cervix, it took her 20 minutes of hard pushing to get his head out. And I watched the doctors and, they, and nurses, they were, they were kind of concerned about that because that shouldn't have been that hard. But when his head came out and his body wasn't out, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life, he cried. From his neck down, he's still inside the womb. From the neck up, he's out of the womb and crying. And when he did that, everything in that delivery room went hyperspeed. It was like somebody gave a signal and everybody moved. And that doctor that had been so gentle at all that point just shoved his hand up inside my wife, grabbed his fingers inside of a, 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 an armpit and jerked that shoulder out and then reached in and pulled that other shoulder out. And then he just kind of slid on out. And I'm thinking, I've never seen one of these before, but I think that's a little unusual. Listen now, after it was all calmed down and, and, you know, and everything was okay and I could see that they were all really relieved and everything was okay, the doctor had a moment. I said, sir, I need to ask you a question. You could see he was kind of nervous about that question. I said, did that baby cry before his head, with only his head out of the womb? He said, yes, sir. That happens on a few very rare occasions, but it happens. He said, but here's the problem. If the desire of that baby to breathe air is strong enough, it can actually work against the contractions and expand his lungs and breathe before he's fully born. But the problem is, once that happens... If you don't get him out quickly, the next contraction that hits that's supposed to be given life will take his life. 
because the contraction will bind the lung for two plus minutes and suffocate him to death. And when a person's hunger for God is so great, they get the baptism of the Holy Ghost before they experience the birth of the water, and that's what medical science calls it as a non-technical term of the baby coming out of the mother's womb, the birth of the water. If that baby's hunger, it, that spiritual baby's hunger is that great that they breathe that quickly before they can experience the birth of the water, the very faith and, and, and efforts of that church that's helping to birth them will actually cause them to die if they don't get baptized. That's why on the day in, in Cornelius' household, when Peter was preaching and the Lord interrupted him, I mean, read Peter's message. You can't, it doesn't even take five minutes to read it. He barely got the word started. Holy Ghost fell. They all got the Holy Ghost. What's the first thing Peter said? Let's find some water. Why? Because that baby's still partially stuck in the womb. The very birth pains of faith that would have given it life will now choke it to death if it's allowed to stay like that. I didn't say repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name is Old Testament. I said it wasn't started in the new. And it is the it is that which opens the door to the new covenant because the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the new covenant because God promised to put his spirit within us to write the law on the fleshly tables of our heart and cause us to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments because his spirit was now resident in us. And by writing, what he meant by writing the laws on the fleshly tables of our heart, he's putting within us the desire to keep his word and to follow him. So, these people standing, around, standing in front of the throne, they had white robes. How could they have had that? I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. The same way that people that died during Jesus' Jesus's ministry would have them. Not the church. You got to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, be filled with the Holy Ghost to be a part of the church. And that's not a prideful apostolic statement. That's just book. It's, it's part of the principles of it. Therefore, are they before the throne and serve him day and night. They, uh, what, what do they do? Serve him, serve him day and night. Here's this group of 24 elders that we know is a figurative number because they were redeemed out of every kindred, people, tongues, and nation, et cetera, et cetera. And they rule and reign with him and sit with him around the throne. And here's this group standing before the throne and they serve him. Not rule and reign with him, they serve him. Oh, that's not the end of it. Let's read. They shall hunger no more, neither shall thirst any more, neither shall sun light on them, nor any heat. And that's directly a re reference to stuff that happens during the Great Tribulation. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Listen now. The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall future tense, lead them unto living fountains of waters. And the Greek word translated fountain there is exactly the same Greek word translated well in 
John 4, when Jesus said to the woman, well, if thou knewest the gift of God, who it is saith unto thee, give me the drink, you would have asked him, him, he'd give you living water. She said, sir, where are you going to get this water from? This well's deep. You don't have anything to draw with. He said, whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. For it shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. It shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. And then he said in John chapter 7, verse 37, In the last day of the great day of the feast, if any man stood and cried, saying, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly, his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the, 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 the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, I remember, uh, which the... Oh, let's read that. Sorry. When I can't remember it, I'm supposed to read it, right? At least that's what I tell myself. So that's John chapter 7, verse 39. Please, dear one. That's my granddaughter. My oldest grandchild. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, future tense. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Slight problem. If you look at your King James printed version, you will see the word given is in italics, which means it was not in the original. And, of course, some of you have heard this over and over, so you'll hear it again. The, the, the rule of biblical interpretation regarding italicized words which were supplied by the translators that was not in the original is this. If the Scripture says exactly the same thing, reading the italicized words in the Scripture, then it's okay to leave them in there. But if reading the verse with the italicized word in, which was not the original, was supplied by the translators who were not divinely inspired, if it changes the message of the word uh, of that verse, then you, if you want to know truth, you read the verse without the italicized words. So, let's see if it's different. But this spake of the Spirit which they believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Is that different than, but this spake of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Is that different? Oh, it is definitely different. You know how? <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> oh, Lord, this is the funnest thing I ever get to do. <laughs> you know how this God without a beginning, without an ending, every place, every time, present, simultaneously, the infinite God who was the I am, decided he was going to do creation. And so the first thing he did was he became Logos. Well, that lets him communicate with and actually create finite. It, 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 Logos allowed the infinite God to create finite. Because everything was created by Logos. Wait a minute now. What is this God that fills all this space made up of? Spirit. Now he is, he's come up with a way <laughs> where he can relate to and communicate with, interact with, and create creation by this infinite God becoming Logos. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to use Logos as the conduit to squeeze part of himself, and I'm not really trying to exaggerate here, but to, this is the way I see it, kind of squeeze part of his divine nature through his manifestation, Logos, into time. So that that part of his divine nature 
could then take up residence in that body he created second in the Logos from the beginning. Because the one living inside of me is not a third anything. It is that infinite one who in his divine wisdom figured out a way that he could take the infinite and somehow put it in the lives of finite beings. Do you understand by him doing that with that particular group that would enter into him and, and by entering into him you enter into that which is, was created in him, this church that was predestined from the foundation of the world to be the intimate part of the Logos. The complement to, the expression of, <laughs> even as we, even as the Logos is the expression of the infinite one, the church is the expression of the Logos. And that was created in the Logos from before the foundation of the world. And that, that, that compliment, that expression of the Logos, the church, the body, not the individuals, but the body. When you and I take advantage of what God has provided and we enter into the Logos, into that body that he created in, his own, in, in the Logos from before the foundation of the world. He then, that allows him to put his very own divine nature into us. He puts us first into him and then puts him into us. And so I'm standing here today. And in God, as much as is possible to even more than is even possible for me to comprehend, this, whatever this soul is inside of me, is directly connected to that. It's a, that's a direct connection. It's not another person. Excuse me, my UPC brethren. I don't even like the word manifestation. It's not another manifestation of him. It's just him. Can I say toned down? from being infinite to being as infinite as he could be inside a finite one? As somebody so eloquently said it to me, I think it was last night, Brother Wright, this is big. I fully understand. I understand. You tell me what word fits. This is big. Big. I'm going to be honest with you. I've been in the church, well, I've been around the church since I was born. Been in the church since I was 12. The church that I've always been around has some kind of chip of inferiority complex on their shoulder. Poor us, everybody looks down on us. And because everybody outside looks down on us, we look down on us. And that just keeps limiting us. And when you limit us, you limit our God. And so just keep squeezing it all down to where we all are. It's just going through the motions. Because we've gotten it all squeezed down so far. The only thing left is just go through the motions and hope in the end we're good enough we don't go to hell.
Because we don't have any hope of anything else. We're we're even afraid to wonder what else is out there. Just don't send me to hell. It's all squeezed down to this little old tiny thing, you know. He that endureth to the end. For some of you, this call to war is given new definition to that verse. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Some of you are receiving and some of you are enduring. And what's going on at the same time? Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. And the word wax there means to grow very gradually. The changers are so incrementally small, you can't identify the changes over a short span of time. In other words, it's not alarming. You pro- I've never tried this, don't have any interest in trying it, quite frankly. But I've heard that the way you cook a frog alive is you put him in a pot of cool water on the stove. And you so gradually, you can do, they claim you can do this. Again, I haven't tried it. I don't prove this. I'm not saying this is gospel. I'm just saying I heard this. That you, <laughs> that, that. Apparently that frog, according to whatever warped person that tried this the first time, (laughs) that you turn the heat on that frog up so gradually that it will sit right there until the water gets hot enough, it cooks him alive and he dies. And he never moves out because the changes in temperature are so gradually, gradually he never gets alarmed for his own safety. Well, that's what's happened in the opposite direction of the church. Because when you were baptized with the Holy Ghost, according to John the Baptist, you were baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. And that fire for so many has so gradually gone out, it's gone so incrementally out that they never even got disturbed over the loss of it until we are now satisfied with having church like a refrigerator and calling it good. Good. Yeah, good. Boy, I felt some goosebumps. No, you were just sitting under an air conditioning duct. If feeling goosebumps is equivalent to God, then God must love the Star Spangled Banner. Because I've never heard it without feeling goosebumps. I took an oath to give my life for that star-spangled banner. How could I not feel goosebumps? Is that God? Is God American? God forbid. That was a British accent you heard, right? God forbid. Right now... If God is American, he is doing a horrible job of being God. You know, the world thinks, especially some elements of the world, some religions of the world, thinks that America and Christianity are synonymous. You're kidding me, right? That proves how little they know. They're reading their own propaganda. If you believe this nation's Christian, ask the president. Ask anybody on his cabinet. Ask any congressman or senator, is this a Christian nation? They will tell you flat out, this is not a Christian nation. Amen, friend. And the more y'all do, the less Christian it gets. It's not a Christian nation. This is not a Christian nation. Christianity and America are not synonymous. They're not interchangeable. And if that bothers you, you better get the sand out of your ears from pulling your head out of the sand as an ostrich because 
you've had it stuck in there way too long. You're going to be shocked. We haven't even have iPads today. Some of you had your, eye, your head in the sand so long, you didn't even know they even made those cumbersome big old things that stuck on a, a, a stalk in the middle of your floor in your car, which we thought was absolutely like space Star Wars, space stuff. I can take a phone call in my car, except the cord is too short, always too short. I remember the first phone I had in my car. I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. I've got a phone in my car. So, Going back to the original point, the people saved in chapter 7 of Revelation, saved in heaven, did not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, did not drink of the living water from those fountains till the Lamb led them to them after they got to heaven. So, if you, my friend, and I have no idea if I'm, if I'm talking to you, and most of you doing a, a really good job of keeping your face blank, good, that's fine with me. I don't want to be picking on you. But you got a problem. If you're apostolic, and you believe in Acts 2.38, then to believe that the rapture is going to take place at the end of the seven years, You've got to believe that there are two plans of salvation in effect on the earth simultaneously and that people get to choose which one they want to follow. One where you can be saved without the Holy Ghost and one where you have to have the Holy Ghost to be saved. It's really that dramatic of a difference. Because that group that we know was saved out of that seven-year period didn't have the Holy Ghost. Oh, and by the way, they didn't have any other promise of God made to the church fulfilled to them once they got there. Not one of them. So who are they? They're not the church. So when I was finished, I looked at my friend, waiting for him to say something. and It was kind of silent for a moment, and he said, you are the most studied pre-tribulation rapture person I've ever talked to. And he got up and walked out of the room. Let's just go here, ask him. He got him walked out. Not man, angry. He knew there was nothing he could say. There was nothing he could say. Not because of me. It's book. It says it right there. It's book. And that has been since, it was 90, 91, somewhere in there. And to this day. He's never attempted to answer those questions. Why? Because you can't believe in post-trib and answer them. You could ignore them and believe in post-trib. But what about, hey, I didn't say I could answer that I've got every other prophecy filled out, filled out and understood. I didn't say I had all understanding of all prophecy. I didn't say that. But if the church... And Jesus Christ are the focal points of God's efforts to let us know what the timing is of the rapture, not the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and anything else going on in our world today. Because Jesus said, when you hear these things and see all these things begin to come to pass, it's the beginning of the end. He called them the beginning of sorrows. And the word sor sorrows there in the Greek is literally labor pains. And we know how labor pains work. They start out, <laughs> ask any lady who's ever had pre-labor 
or whatever they call it, false labor if it was false pain. Oh, that's false labor. And nothing false about these pains. I went through that twice with my wife. There wasn't nothing false about those pains. And of course, the first time around, I was ready to head off to the hospital with the first sign of a pain. They'd stop a while. They'd start back up. and No, no, it's not it. It's pre-labor. It's not false labor. It's, it's God's way of letting you know this isn't it, but it's close. But even once labor starts, it's not the birth. Those pain, what's, what's the first thing the doctor asks? How far apart are they? Uh, so now you want me to count how long I'm not in pain? We're not going to talk about how long the pain lasts. Let's talk about how, how decreasing the amount of time I have is between them. And the pains start, and then, you know, they 10 minutes apart, 7 minutes apart, 6 minutes apart, whatever they are. They probably started much earlier than that. You just didn't notice them as much because they start, the farther apart they are, the less intense they are, and as they get closer together, the more intense they get, and it's still not the birth. And you can get all worked up over all this stuff if you want to, but this morning's lesson told you what you're supposed to be focused on. God is going to fulfill his word. And rather than buying you some obscure little place in a hole in the wall out in the middle of no place and socket it full of food and weapons. You know what I can't believe? I can't believe Christians are doing that. Because what does the scripture say? Preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's kind of hard to do from some obscure, secretive hideout in the middle of the wilderness while you're protecting all your food you've hoarded with your illegal weapons. Yeah, the book says do that, doesn't it? Let me tell you something. That's... Oh, Jesus. I'm saying it because he's given it to me to say. And some of you are going to think it's me. I could care less, but this is not me. Doing that is just as much Antichrist as the Antichrist it claims it's trying to avoid. Oh, but if we don't do that, we may die. Really? You mean like death has never been connected with the gospel? <laughs> the most powerful fertilizer there is is the blood of the martyrs fertilizing the seed of the gospel. And you hear me right now. You will be shocked at the number of brothers and sisters of ours that die between now and the rapture for the gospel's sake. Because the church in America has adopted the same spirit as America. That's why the Twin Towers was so shocking to us, so disturbing to us. Yes, for those 3,000 plus people that died and their loved ones, it was a horrible tragedy. But have you ever noticed any of the body counts of tsunamis and earthquakes in other parts of the world? It is not uncommon for thousands of people in other nations to die in a tsunami, in an earthquake, in a typhoon. why it was so shocking to us 
is that kind of thing doesn't happen in America. Because we cry peace and safety. And the book says when they cry peace and safety, sudden destruction's coming. I'm not trying to be critical here, but if you be honest with yourself, you read about that seventh church in Revelation, America in general is the closest thing in the world to that. How many of us, and I don't mean just you and I, but us, at some level have the attitude we're rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. But we don't know that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Why? Because Jesus is on the outside knocking on the door and we don't even want to be bothered. Because we do not believe he's missing. Because we've learned how to have church so well and preach so well without him. We don't even know he's not in us and with us. We have gotten it down, friend. We know how to do it. Years ago, years ago, over on Bay Ridge Avenue in Naples, there was a really well-established church, and the pastor there was very well thought of in town. And I, I got the word that there was a, uh, was trouble brewed in his church. And uh, all of a sudden, this well-respected pastor that had been there for 10, 12, 15 years, something like that, he no longer was there. And I got, was up praying one morning, and the Lord said, go see Harry Grimes. So what am I supposed to go tell him? Just go testify to him. So I went over and knocked on Harry Grimes' front door. He invited me in. And I said, I'm Pastor Chester Wright, and we were the first United Pentecostal Church of Annapolis, Maryland, Inc. back then. What a mouthful. And uh, I said, uh, Pastor Grimes, I was praying for you this morning. The Holy Ghost sent me to come over here. I said, uh, can I just share my testimony with you? He said, sure. He was so gracious. So for the next hour, he just let me talk. I talked to him about being raised in the church and, and then going to the Naval Academy and not having any church to go to and God stripping me of everything and putting it all back his way and then, you know, and how how God had worked in my life and how he miraculously got, got me out of the Navy way ahead of time so I could preach. And I went through all of that. And, and then I shared with him the revelation God gave me for myself while I was studying at the academy on the fact that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was actually one person, one being, and that we need to be baptized in the name of that one God and we need to receive the Holy Ghost. He said, well, Pastor Wright, let me tell you a story. I said, okay. He said, I was at my church for many years, and I love them. They love me. But there were some people in the church who were very hungry, and they started visiting some other places, and they said they got the Holy Ghost started talking in tongues. Well, they, they loved me, and they loved this church, so they kept coming here. And every once in a while, they couldn't contain themselves, and they'd talk their talking tongues in our church. Well, Pastor, the, our church has always had the doctrine that we didn't believe in speaking in tongues. So I got, I got to wondering about that for myself. This man was a Greek and Hebrew scholar. So he said, I got to studying the book of Acts from the original manuscript, from the Greek. And when I did, I saw that not only receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost was for us today, but the, the initial evidence, this is his words, the initial evidence, 
the common experience they all had when they first received it was they spoke in other tongues. I said, well, Pastor Grimes, have you spoken in tongues? He said, not yet, but I won't do. He said, I, I hadn't hardly finished that study. And God showed me all of that. And my board of trustees called me in. One of that group is either full of devils or full of saints, believers, good people, one or the other. And they said, Pastor Grimes, we got a problem. What's that? There's people in our church believe speaking in tongues. We want you to stop it. You know our church doesn't believe in speaking in tongues. He said, well, I know, but let me tell you what, what's happening. He gave them his testimony. That He gave them his testimony. And he told them, brethren, he quoted verses and he quoted the Greek and all that. And said, you know, speaking in tongues is in the Bible. It's for us today. And they looked at him and said, Pastor Grimes, we love you. You've been a good pastor us all these years. But we don't believe in speaking in tongues. And you either stop them or put them out if they won't stop, or you leave with them. And he told me, he said, Pastor Wright, I looked at those, in the faces of those men I'd loved and pastored many years and said, well, then consider this my resignation. And he walked away from that church and a good income. He bought this little building. And those people and others that spoke in tongues began to go to church with him there. And I show up on his door. And I witness to him about baptism in Jesus' name and the oneness of God. He said, you know what it was that caused me to even be open to considering the possibility that speaking in tongues was real? Hear me now. He said, our church has an old history. It was a part of the original holiness movement. Not meaning, not meaning his local church, but his organization. He said, but we have fought the spirit and the things of the spirit for so long. I, I just came to myself one day and realized if the rapture took place, it wouldn't change anything we do. If the rapture took place, it wouldn't change our services at all. He said, Pastor Wright, that so began to disturb me that when I, these people began to get the Holy Ghost, it opened me up to even consider the possibility it was real. I went back when the Holy Ghost sent me back about three months later. And he did the talking this time. And he gave me a study on the oneness of God from the Hebrew and the Greek as good, if not better, than anything I've ever heard one of my brethren do, ever. All from the original languages. And on Acts 2.38. Now, his wife didn't want this stuff we've got, so he was never able to come this direction. But I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> he went to his church and started preaching what God had shown him. They got upset and left. Now he's got no church left. Well, we had tried to buy that building that they bought before they bought it. We didn't have any money for a down payment. We, we couldn't afford to buy it. So I got a call one day. He said, Pastor Wright, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but our church is folded, yeah. Well, we're a nonprofit corporation, and we can't sell the church and keep the money, so we're going to give it to somebody. And I've talked to my board, and we're going to give it to you. The only offering plates we've ever owned were part of that building. The vacuum cleaner, the PA system, the Bibles, the seats, the PA system. We just walked in, started having a church. But the point of the story 
is I hear that man's words in my head too many times when I'm places, places God sent me, places I, I, I want to be a part of and be help if I can anyway. And I look at that and I say, They don't need Jesus. They got this all figured out, worked out. They know how to do this. I was doing a uh, building the bridge seminar in a district somewhere between the Canadian border and the Mexican border and the Gulf of this Gulf uh, uh, of the, the Gulf. Somewhere in there. Somewhere between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And uh, it was in a warmer climb than this. And so, and it was in March. And I got in there and it was well before the service that night. And the brother that had invited me picked me up. And <laughs> I forgot you were here. Oh, praise God. <laughs> Picked me up. And it was a little bit of precipitation, little tiny ice crystals hitting the windshield. And he said, and it's not going to be good for this service tonight. I said, what? What are you talking about? Oh, this weather. They won't come. It wasn't hard even making a dent on the road. You couldn't even hardly see the, the road was wet. Well, he knew his people, the people of the place where the area, I will start to say district, but I, can't, I don't want to say district because I'd give you a wrong impression because it was a district. But anyway, <clears throat> he knew them. Well, the place we were going to have service didn't have heat because we didn't have to have heat. It's a warmer place. And it was all set up beautiful, nice. But it was, it was a little cold. It, I mean, it was probably all the way down to 65 inside. So we had to move the service into the dining hall, which was heated. Well, we just couldn't move the service. It was a seminar. We couldn't move the service because we had to move all the instruments and, and all the PA system because there was a choir invited to come. And they weren't going to be happy if they didn't get to sing. Well, we went through all of that. And I wondered to myself, wait a minute. All these other folks that were going to come to this seminar didn't come because of the weather, but this group that was invited to sing, they, they took their life in their own hands and drove in that horrible weather, not to be ministered to, but to perform. So Jesus and I had to have a really quick talk, and I had to push all that human emotion down lest I really be a problem. So, so I got, old, got me a place over in the corner while all of that was going on, and I, me and Jesus, we just had a real good talk. And, 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 I, and by his grace, I was able to get all that under control. And when I did, he spoke to me. And he said this to me literally. He said, my church could reach the world if they weren't so addicted to having good church. Hear me before God, he said exactly that to me. They were good. The music was good. The sing was good. I felt the presence of God. I really did. I loved to sing. I felt the presence of God. But there wasn't near that much interest in talking about souls as there was in feeling good. Now, I told you I was setting you up. All that you heard this morning 
the promise of Abraham, the oath God made to Abraham, swear by himself. If I don't do this, I'm not God. The scope of that promise. Every nation, and that word nation in the Hebrew does not mean, or in the Greek, a, a governmental entity surrounded by borders, but more like tribes of people. Every family, however you define family, is every, uh, is, is a living lineage, excuse me, of a bloodline or a nuclear family, father, mother, and children. <coughs> every group of people, every family of people is going to receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, which is the blessing of Abraham. But it's promised to the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles are going to be up at the rapture. Because after the rapture, the Lord is turning back to the children of Israel. <coughs> the whole purpose of the seven years is to turn back, first and foremost, to turn back to Israel. And Israel turn back to God. <coughs> and of course, to pour out God's wrath on this earth for its iniquity or at least the beginning of the judgment of it. So here's the problem you and I have sitting here today. If God is going to do this, or he is a liar, and it's got to happen before the rapture, and if you're following the events of the Antichrist, then you sure must be feeling pressure because this has got to be fulfilled before the rapture takes place. Or God's a liar. You see, we're not talking about a, a promise again. We're talking about an oath made by deity. An oath made by deity. An oath made by deity. Against his deity. And I'm standing here today. Oh, I wasn't standing much. I was moving. But I'm ministering today. And the spirit of revelation was amazing. And I'm watching light of understanding come in eyes all over this place. I felt spirits, hearts leaping in the awareness that came to you because you saw it. It was just so plain, so clear. In fact, some of you thought to yourself, there's no other way it can be. Well, now we're talking about the timing of it. And it's not some future time. It's not some future time. By... Several fairly reliable sources. I have read that the first century revival reached approximately 10% of the known world. According to those figures, the Romans were very meticulous census takers because that's how they financed their empire, was taxing those who were under their power. And so they wanted to make sure they did a really good count so nobody got away with not paying taxes. And it is estimated by several theologians that approximately 10% of the known world, which was in the ballpark of the Roman census of 250 million people in the known world, that part of the world under the Roman Empire 
was approximately 25 million people. Somebody asked me today, how many, how many people of our faith are there in the world? I've heard estimates as low as 10 million. I've heard estimates as high as maybe 30 million that we know of. But that's been a little more broader than most of you are willing to be in defining what's saved and what's not saved for yourself personally. Of course, you and I aren't God. Aren't we happy? So I got a question for you. Let's say, let's just say that we really, really are ignorant and we don't know what's going on to the degree that there's 100 million. If he, if, you know, I understand God's hiding 6,000 999 from Elijah when he thought he was alone. God said, I got 7,000 more. But in this day of time of communication, I don't know where he's hiding 70 million people that believe like we do. But for the sake of discussion, what if there's 100 million out of 7.5 billion I've had a couple of people comment to me some things I said on apostolic iron. And obviously it, they were a part of the, the group of Christians that believe it, essentially everybody's saved. That's, that's basically the point. If, if he said, it was a couple of different people. This one particular guy said, if, if what you believe is true, there's going to be a whole lot more people in hell than heaven and how does God and the cross get any glory out of that? Well, the Bible also says judge nothing before the time. But no matter how great this revival is going to be, Jesus prophesied, broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Many that be that go there in that, but narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to life everlasting and few there be that find it. He said that. I'm not claiming I understand that, but he said that. Exactly what that means, I don't know, but he said that. The one thing we can come say definitively is that the number that make it is smaller than the number that doesn't. By his terminology. But I'm going all the way back to the point here. <laughs> the infinite God has stepped out of the boat, so to speak. And he's laid it out there on the line. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. And I am going so far to be able to convince you this is what I'm going to do. I have sworn against my very own nature that I will do this. Well, I, how, how's that going to happen, Brother Wright? How about this? When he was entering into Jerusalem and the multitude was crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the priests said, stop them because that was worship. And he was letting them worship. And they said, stop them. Shut them up. He's, shut them up. And Jesus said, if they hold their peace, because this is the plan of God, because this is going to happen, I'm going to do this regardless who I can get to cooperate with this. He said, if they hold their peace, the stones will cry out. They did. I'm looking at them. Didn't Peter say we are lively stones? We are stones that have been brought alive. And God is bringing the praise out of living stones. What am I, point am I making? He replaced them. 
He replaced them because some of those that were crying, where were those that were crying Hosanna that day when the multitude was saying crucify him, crucify him a few days later? Where were they? They were replaced. And I'm saying to you, my dear friends, brothers and sisters that are sitting here and those that are on this live stream and those that will watch this later, you sit there in your complacency and, and you, you rest scriptures to, to justify the way you are. And you hear me, the almighty infinite God has vowed with a vow, sworn an oath, he's going to do this or he's not God. And if you and I don't participate, he will replace us so quick that you won't even know you've been replaced. The only thing you're going to do is wake up one day and see that you're a spectator in heaven's stands while somebody else does and receives and participates in what you were given the opportunity to be a part of. And if that doesn't shake you to the marrow of your bones, there's no hope for you. I know that doesn't sound very kind, but it's the truth whether it's kind or not. If that doesn't move you, if that doesn't stir you, if that doesn't cause you to examine yourself in the light of the word all over again and say, okay, God, don't let me miss this. Whatever you've got to do to me, whatever you've got to do in me, whatever's got to happen in my life, whatever's got to take place in my circumstance, whatever's got to happen, don't let me fail to be a part of this. I'm almost 68. On the Sunday after the 18th of February, I will have had the Holy Ghost 56 years. There's been some good days. There's been some horrible days. And most all the days have been somewhere in between from the circumstances. I have not come this far, gone through all of this, suffered this, struggled with this, endured this, experienced this, to end up a spectator when God does the greatest thing he's ever done in the earth. I will not be a spectator. Come on, is this your response to God? You're not responding to me. Come on, you're supposed to be responding to God. This is not an emotional response to me. This is a spiritual response to God. You can't do anything to me bad enough to cause me to be offended enough to hold a, to want to hold a grudge enough to miss out on this. You can't offer me anything that's valuable enough, any position important enough to make me willing to trade this for that. There's no possession, there's no life, there's no lifestyle that you could offer me that I would trade this for that. Come on. We've already established, I can teach a whole lot more if that's the will of God, but that's not what this is about. You came here to go home changed. Then change. Come on. Right now in the name of Jesus. Right now in the name of Jesus. You came here to go home change. Then in Jesus name change.
Come on. If God wants to do anything else, he'll let us know. But there's been corporate ministry. Now it's you and Jesus. Now it's Jesus and you. Come on. We may be all praying at the same time, but all the ministry taking place right now is one-on-one, Jesus and you. Come on. Come on, come on. Lord, I'll give you everything but. Lord, I'll go everywhere but. Lord, I'll do everything you want me to do but. If you know anything about Jesus, what he wants out of you is on the other side of your exception. If it's that important to you, it's that important to God. If it's important enough for you to hold it back, it's important enough to him to ask for it. Come on. Well, I'm giving him all of this. Can I keep this? No. If that's important enough to you to hang on to, it's important enough to you, to him, for you to give it to him. He doesn't want you to give the stuff you don't care about. He wants you to give your best. He wants you to give the most important to you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, come on. We're, such a, we're in such a pattern of praying a few minutes and then getting distracted and moving on. No, no, press, press. It's barely 2.15. This is scheduled to go for another 45 minutes. Forget the schedule. Forget the schedule. If God quits in five minutes, it's okay with me. But if he go, if he has you pray another hour, is that okay with you? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come on, come on, come on. Come on. 
He alaba kasata haye. He lorobo kushata haye. He alaba lorobo kurata tata baba haye. Ie kahata hasaka tahaye. Ie larata haye. Ie alaba kahaye. Ie alaba tahala rada bata haye. Jesus name. Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name when you're through praying for yourself find somebody else to pray for let the Lord use you right now if you're not praying it's time for you to pray for somebody else if you've done all the praying for you you need to pray then find somebody else and when you're through praying for them Pray, pray for somebody else. Come on. Either, either let the Lord help you or you be a blessing. Come on. He is blessing you for you to be a blessing. He is blessing you to be a blessing. He is blessing you to be a blessing. Jesus name put your word in us so deep Lord that we're not going to abandon it Saturday morning that we're not going to leave it behind Saturday morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.
whatever. I need her tonight. She's on tonight. I don't know. In the name of Jesus. 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 Come on, the Holy Ghost is in the place. The Spirit of the Lord is manifested in the house. He's not backed off. Don't you back off. He hasn't slowed down. Don't you slow down. Come on. If you're through praying for yourself, pray for somebody else. If, you need, if you're still praying, then expect somebody to pray with you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Complete restoration. In the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. I, I'm not going to use this lady's name, but here's a comment on apostolic iron I've just read. She said, I watched your service last night and was amazed that you seem not to need the loud music and singing to invite the presence of the Almighty. I turned 80 on Monday, and it's been years and years since I saw all the worshipers caught up in the spirit and no onlookers. I don't know this lady. Would you please receive that as a word from God? I'm serious. Come on. The Lord's trying to make a point here. The Lord's trying to make a point here. Not anti-music and singing, but pro-worship for those that, for learning how to get into the presence of God against entertainment and for true praise. God deliver us of the spirit of entertainment. God deliver us of the spirit of entertainment. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Jesus name. I want to do this a little different. I'd like for a minimum of three, a max of five to get together, preferably people you don't know that well. If you just end up with somebody that you know, fine, but I would prefer that it not be people you know. We're going to pray one for another because we are in this together. We are a part of the body of Christ. Come on. Come on, don't stand around waiting for them to come to you. Find somebody. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. A minimum of three. A max of five. Minimum of three. A max of five. Come on. Come on, let's pray. Come on. Come on, let's pray with each other. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for the body of Christ. That's good, let's pray. That's good, that's good. Come on, there's good stuff happening right now. If the Lord takes you in intercession, go in intercession. There's already some people in intercession. Wow. Ha. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.
Let's switch it up. One more time. Let's find somebody else to pray with. Come on. Let's switch it up. Find somebody else. Come on. One more time. this thing. Jesus name. Jesus name. Jesus name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Itahala no 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 bo korata tata baba hai. Iala no 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 bo korata tata baba kahai. Iala no 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 bo korata tata baba hai. Now let's praise him together. Come on, let's praise him together. Let's praise him together. Come on. Let's praise him together. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Some of you are still praying. I don't want you to stop that. But this is not a commandment. This is a strong suggestion. 
It's only 241. You say only. Tonight is going to be quite intense. Please, I beg of you. You say more intense than all of this? Yeah, probably. So, uh, I'm, 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 I'm asking you very kindly but very pointedly, would you please go get something to eat as quickly as possible? Please do not sit around half the afternoon and uh, fellowship. Please find some place and get horizontal and don't run your mouth. And if you don't go to sleep, it lets, at least just let your mind rest. Okay? While you are doing that, and some of you have heard me teach this before. So Isaiah 28, 11, and 12 says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, and here's the negative part, yet they would not hear. My comments about speaking in tongues and the amount that I speak in tongues, easily 50%, sometimes 75% or more of the tongues I pray throughout the day are rest and refreshing tongues. There's no intensity to them. There's no effort to flow out. It is letting him put back in supernaturally. I, I'm almost 68 years old. I'm not standing up here because I got great health. I can't go like this session after session because I'm in good shape unless you consider round a shape. But I have learned how to let the Spirit put back in. And you can lay down and sleep and it's not going to do the same thing for you. Sleep if you can. But as you can, quietly, and of course the rest of refreshing tongues is quiet. There's virtually no emotion or, or demonstration. But it's just allowing the Spirit to put back in. It's... This is it, just like this. Whatever, whatever your tongue sounds like or whatever, this is rest and refreshing for me. Mama Matahaya, die kolarata tahaya, die lolorobo korata basatai. Mama makaharata tabahaya, die kasaka tahaya, die kie kalarata tabahaya, die kie kularata tahaya, die kalarata basatai. And in just that few moments of time, while my feet hurt really bad, the rest of me feels really good. I'm serious. And if you were watching and feeling in the spirit, you could literally feel the waves of strength coming back in. And it was really like waves just came in. And there were times I, I was just kind of taking a breath between it, just... Whew, just, you know, there was some more. Was it giving out? You know, the sad thing is there's so many Pentecostals that don't have a clue about that. And so they get burnt out. Burnout is what happens to people that don't know how to walk in the Spirit and don't know how to fellowship in the Spirit. And if you don't know how to do that, you and Jesus may need to have a long talk and you need to learn how to do that. Because if you get involved with the Spirit and all the Spirit wants to do through you, the last thing God wants is for your body to get so worn out He can't use you but short periods of time and to do short amount of things. Other than resting my feet, you can believe what you want to believe. But this second, I could go another three hours. And that's not human strength. He 
Come on, enter into it right now. Not, it's not loud. It's not loud. It's not emotional. And the focus of rest and refreshing tongues is not what's flowing out of you. It's how you're opening yourself up to Jesus and you're letting him put back into you all of the virtue that you have, you have put out as you've prayed and ministered and, and received the word and revelation. Praise God. Seven o'clock sharp. See you.